Hello, hello. Welcome to the conference held by the Center of Fortune Art Center, and uh, this is the uh, second day of the conference, which is devoted to the uh, cultural heritage on occupied territories. So yesterday, we completely dedicated our activity to the cultural heritage on the occupied territories. And so the focal point was the sort of survey, ethnical and cultural survey on the occupied territories and through some modifications I should like to give uh, floor to Mr. Bejan Horava. Bejan Horava, who will uh, deliver speech on Bedia uh, Monastery, Bedia Church in 19th, late 19th, early 20th century. Hello. Uh, yesterday it was very interesting and uh, uh, still, I think that uh, we are intrigued and uh, uh, very promising speeches uh, uh, will coming up, are upcoming. So, Bedia Church um, uh, will be considered uh, in late 19th and early 20th century. So, I should like uh, uh, to just shed lusher on the materials which deal with the Georgian and Russian press of then times uh, uh, concerning the church and its state, its conditions in late 19th and early 20th century. So, uh, also, 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 we shall deal with the facts which are delivered by our researchers in their studies. Bedia, Bedia Church in 19th century was the center, the bishopric center. And in 18th century, formerly in 1760s, it became a sort of ordinary church because the bishopric was abolished later later even services were renewed there and uh, you know that Diani, the princess of uh, Samagrello very highly appreciated the clinical and uh, uh, activity of clergymen at that monastery Levan Thieves Dadiani the uh, chief and uh, the priest of Magrello, uh, he and his historian gives that Levan uh, Sharbashitza was the owner of this uh, church when the Russian army attacked this uh, church. The Levan Sharbashitza, Levan Sharbashitza, seeded this church and, of course, fortress to Dadiani. So he gave up and absorbed his rights over this church. And late 18th century, this area and this building was a sort of something like residential palace. Ambrosik Khepaya, well-known Georgian clergyman in 19th century, he, uh, studied that issue, studied Bedia Church, and he said that up to early 19th century, it was intact, safe and sound. Just only since 1812, the church was damaged after the shelling by Russian militaries and Russian artillery uh, cannons. And, but there are some other sources which reject this idea and does not prove that Russian shelling took place. 
regrettably we have no other sources at our disposal so in 1830s Bedia church already was damaged when this church was damaged very accurately concerning this we have no information David Zarentelli was the head of the Amagrello bishopric area and he even signed the clerics clergyman in order to propagate Christianity there in the, the part of uh, modern Abkhazia, particularly Samurzak Anno. And regrettably, the death of uh, Martha, who was the princess of Samagrelo, uh, the principality, uh, just uh, cost the best. His activities, scientific studies in Georgia. He even measured Bedia Church and made copies of the frescoes and murals. Later, he handed over those documents to Marie Brosset. Marie Brosset personally just came there and learned out the state of this uh, church. And he wrote that uh, this church was damaged and there were shrubs and bushes uh, uh, which surrounded uh, this territory and even entered and pierced the walls too. So, and the church, uh, Bedia church was uh, uh, pretty, how to say, pretty damaged. It was not very huge. And Regrettably, it was just covered by uh, by trees and some you know, other attempts. Russian authorities thought to renew Christianity, invigorate Christianity in Abkhazia. Therefore, in 1861, the Bedia Church first decision was tried to carry into effect along with an appropriate, appropriate uh, uh, just decision. And the Viceroy, uh, Mikhail Romanov, the Grand Duke, ordered General Major General Vassil Bayman, he uh, stepped for set up uh, the issue of the renewal of Bedia, Dranda, and Lifni churches. But in vain, in 1868, uh, Bedia, which was visited by Imereti uh, Bishop Gabriel, in order, uh, why? Because this territory was under the auspices of Gabriel and his bishop. He said that the landscape is beautiful there and uh, the walls are in a good condition arches two arcs two cupola roof two and uh, but there are trees even and uh, inside uh, it's um, how to say fields by uh, domestic animals uh, so and uh, it's surrounded by the precipice. In the western side are the relics of the damaged uh, uh, chapel. So, uh, uh, typo. Uh, so, and uh, uh, it will be very useful to renew, to uh, restore it in order to invigorate and strengthen Christianity in Abkhazia. It won't be very expensive work. And Bishop Gabriel once again comes back to this idea. In his opinion, Bedia, Granta, Mokwi, and Litme churches all together maybe. Uh, 12, at least 16,000 Russian rubles of the times would be enough. enough. Russian uh, expert on restoration, uh, one fellow, uh, he came there and uh, he gave the complete description.
description and even photos of those uh, of that church. He made the graphic painting and uh, he stated and mentioned that it was in a very deplorable condition, partly declined, uh, destroyed, and covered with the plants, herbs, etc. Uh, situation was not too encouraging. Uh, and uh, no. according to his opinion, uh, you see, architectural forms and shapes, uh, uh, they were able to give the picture and the meaning perception of the former, original uh, just condition of the church in 1892. Uh, the indigenous generation of Samusa, uh, it uh, stated the issue topic of uh, the restoring of this church. And uh, uh, authorities decided, local authorities decided to levy speculation and also stated that donations are well, well welcome. So I shall be brief. And journalists wrote that uh, we had no time to describe completely and accurately this church. You see, especially we must pay attention to the church of Nuriel and the states of the Queen Tamar, which is depicted on the southern wall of the church. And uh, uh, she is crowned and the face is pretty well visible. So actually, there is no damage. There are no damages at all. On the one hand, yes. So and five fingers of the right hand are very well visible. The church has cupola roof. Regrettably, it's damaged, and the rest will be damaged and fall down soon. In my opinion, he says. Journalists also state and mention that people, indigenous population who lived in the vicinity, they brought, actually just plundered these relics. They took these dollops for their own buildings uh, in order to turn them into you know, tombstones and so on. So, and uh, Betty uh, Church uh, is mentioned only in that uh, article of that journalist. So, and in one publication, we uh, found uh, found information about uh, uh, fresco image of Queen Tamar. Later, uh, Tedosahopia ethnographist uh, paid visit and described that uh, church and described especially the uh, face um, picture fresco uh, of Queen Tamar. He said that it's not it's a little bit vague and it is not it's impossible to uh, clearly just see it. So and also also the image of the savior Lord Jesus Christ is depicted as the one in the one mural. Uh, says nothing about Tamar's fresco. He only says that uh, this uh, everybody uh, looks for there to uh, find, to look for the uh, tombstone of King Bagrat. The third, the first king of United Georgia, but in vain, there are no uh, traces. So, anonymous author, anonymous author, he says 
we must take into account maybe maybe it will be possible it will be possible just to uh, find uh, some other uh, data in, um, concerning uh, Tamar in Tamar's image. Also, we have some other information which comes from one cleric, and he decided to renew service there. Uh, yes, it took place in 1909, and uh, later, in spite of resistance, he came to Suhumi Bishop Creek, uh, and uh, he made Bedia uh, at his residence. Ambrose Kalaya said that uh, policy and politics uh, really make him impeded uh, the uh, restoration of this church and the russians they wanted to turn to convert uh, um, uh, bedia into russian church yes uh, Shelly, he succeeded to uh, just to uh, renew their services and he even even was trying to use uh, the great trust uh, and uh, uh, benevolence of uh, Andrei Ochtomsky, a Russian top grade clergyman who just uh, uh, was uh, treated him very well to renew the Pedia uh, church. And thus it speeded. And in any way, he uh, just uh, take, took care of this uh, church, at least if he could not restore something. But he succeeded to retain the existing situation. So this um, church uh, was named after. Andrew the first call. Russia denied, uh, uh, decided to set up there the Father's Convention named after the, the most holy mother of the God in Vlahar. So, during the time, the journalist of Imereti newspaper said that Joseph Joseph Shelia he set up a small church where where service was held in Georgia. So Shervashidze and other other once uh, other Georgian nobleman that donated. Uh, the church uh, their uh, land some pieces of their land uh, so and uh, the same uh, time he built special building which was the residence and uh, uh, habitat for uh, uh, friars and nuns so Joseph Shalia he was concerned by the issue, uh, by the success of Russians uh, who turned Randa and New Athos uh, into Russian monastery. Therefore, he wanted to resist Russian encroachment. And therefore, he turned Pythia uh, from Friars' Father's Convention into Nunnery. And he later he died. So and uh, later, really, this uh, turned into wow. Well, so and uh, just only. Uh, 
Yes, and uh, they this now they uh, served very very vigorously. Of course, uh, Ambrosi Halaya contributed a lot of. He contributed a lot of, especially during democratic Georgia. He even addressed it. Uh, he even addressed it, the democratic uh, Georgia's government uh, to assist them in order just uh, to allocate a certain amount of money in order to help nuns to remove to other church and to remove also uh, their uh, luggage. Uh, and uh, I'm just the uh, and experts know this, but I shall repeat that Ambrosi in 1920 finished his research, Bedia and Bedia Church, which was the first professional study of on Bedia Church and consists of very interesting, uh, very, very uh, serious uh, and checked facts. Since 1921, Bedia, Bedia Church, of course, uh, uh, suffered great difficulties because uh, Bolsheviks came, uh, Georgia was forcefully sanitized, and uh, Bolsheviks were at peace. And uh, during that time, a lot of churches were demolished uh, in Georgia. And in 1925, 19. 28 we have a certain amount of information about the activity of the nuns of uh, in Bedia monastery since in 1930 Bedia sees its existence as the acting church it was closed it looks like locked and uh, and uh, recently we have uh, Found out, Kelsey uh, Mitchell uh, he found out uh, uh, the uh, letter written by the nun, one of the nuns. And, and uh, this letter says that the Soviet authorities demolished, uh, encroached, uh, devastated everything. Nuns were put to flight, they were forced to uh, cattle. And, by 1930, we may say that the Badia Church actually ceased its existence. So, in the second half, second half of um, 1930s, uh, uh, so Georgian and you know, foreign foreign uh, researchers they gave very interesting information about uh, Badia Church. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, you had very interesting uh, paper. This information was very significant. You are aware about discussion about our regime, and we uh, we are plan we plan discussion after all papers. But if somebody wants just very brief, uh, short question or just very short comment in a nutshell. And discussion, profound discussion, will take place later. Today, do we have information? Yes, yes, good. And do we have information, information today about the church, or the footprints? Yes, somehow, somehow we have, uh, somehow we have. Uh, it, uh, it's in a very, very deplorable condition uh, because. Uh, so-called restoration damaged it more rather than gave some uh, positive results. Uh, and uh, regrettably, even relics of the murals were, had been washed down through the so-called very poor and very bad restoration. Soon, the book will be published about Bedia. It will be illustrated, well illustrated. And uh, these photos will be arranged in that 
very good way that they will first demonstrate the former condition of the murals and nowadays very deplorable conditions when after the so-called very poor and very unskilled restoration these uh, murals were actually washed down yes yes so actually it's look like a, a deliberate crime the next next uh, Mrs. Leah Achaladze, uh, uh, yes, Sukhumi University, associated professor. Josep Arzimba, the Abkhaz champion of uh, Georgian art. Welcome. Hello. My presentation deal with Abkhaz champion of uh, Georgian art. Uh, Yosef Arzimba and Yosef Arzimba, he contributed a lot of, uh, and uh, he was in charge of uh, uh, the defense and protection of uh, the protection of these art and these. Uh, he died in 1942. And uh, this year is the anniversary, 120th anniversary of the birth of this uh, really great luminary of art and cultural heritage in Georgia. In spite of that, Joseph Martin, but regrettably, he was just 20, he was 40, 40, uh, yes, two years old. Yes, he uh, was educated, graduated from Sofumi Seminary, uh, first at Gariti uh, Primary School, then at uh, Seminary, uh, so, and then at Felicity uh, Technical University, and uh, all his life uh, was dedicated to this uh, issue. Uh, so, uh, he during his three years, uh, he spent in his native village and uh, mm, uh, just uh, all his green years uh, were surrounded by very interesting and very uh, valuable historical relics, historical artifacts, and uh, uh, just to, let's say, so cultural and historical uh, heritage. Uh, so he created this seminary and later it was converted this uh, educational center was converted into the pedagogical uh, sort of institution like college uh, college uh, so he also acted as an ethnographer he for instance gathered a uh, roar uh, various religions uh, various uh, folklore pieces and so on. Of course, he could not be inadvertent and negligible towards uh, architecture, architectural uh, relics. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, he gathered uh, various pieces, various artifacts uh, of the formerly demolished uh, just architectural uh, monuments. And, of course, uh, he, uh, he uh, just uh, uh, yes, uh, also uh, his knowledge was uh, also enriched by uh, his visits through his visits in Tbilisi and they studied uh, there. He went to the museum, he gathered uh, enthusiastic individuals, he started working in several directions. So the collection of the old artifacts and their preservation in the museum, as well as the collection of Abkhazian ethnographic materials, 
So with his name is collected, connected the gathering of many, many materials on this first stage. And then on the catalogization of the materials existing in the archives and the museum in the creation and expansion of the exhibition area in the short period of time in all this direction he managed <coughs> to attain serious success firstly he managed to uh, enrich the exhibition area and streamlining of the museum exhibition space so his talent of the uh, scientist so was uh, manifested and he in a present history he paid the uh, paid the uh, attention to Abkhazian Mohajirs and uh, those Abkhazians who lived uh, long years. So and he published that in the Russian language and Mohajir's history uh, was story was uh, very risky and it required the bravery from Abkhazians regarding the phenomenon of those who lived long in the Abkhazian State Museum. So this started by the leadership of Yosef, uh, Yosef Arzinba. So there was a different direction uh, established in the museum that was interested in learning the long life of Abkhazian people who lived for a long life and so at that uh, academician uh, so took uh, interest in those in Abkhazia who lived long so and they wanted to uh, uh, reveal the secret of this long life of uh, Abkhazian so the people who lived uh, 117 years so in 120 years who be who remember the uh, russian turkish wars crimea turkish wars so also he started so learning the black uh, Black Abkhazians, the learning of Black Abkhazians, Caucasian so-called Negroes. He raised this issue for the first time and he made the historians and ethnographers interested so in the story of their coming to Abkhazia. First, by his initiatives in the exhibition area of the museum was brought the Abkhazian living house. So the interest to the Abkhazian so house was uh, related to Yosef Arzimba's name. First time he brought this house, Apatsha, who is uh, close to Megrelian Patsha. So they considered that it was traditional Abkhazian and they considered it today that it was traditional. So, small hut, uh, which uh, triggered huge interest in the viewers. So the scientists took interest in this issue from that period. And later on, they studied another Aquasca, so the house of Abkhazia. So the uh, sample of which is standing in the Ethnographic Museum in, in Tbilisi. So different visits to different corners of um, different corners of Abkhazia. So there were pictures made, so and description. And this uh, made renowned the Abkhazian so state museum and Abkhazian uh, area study museum. And they were placed, uh, and this museum was placed in the same building as the Abkhazian state museum. All his activities was directed to introduce the scientific research work. He was looking for young cadre who would be interested in the scientific activities in the museum. So while working in the museum, he also took interest in uh, scientific activities. He was paying much attention attention to the material uh, culture, uh, so monuments. So he wanted his artifacts not to stay without the scientific attention, either to publish information on them in the newspaper publications. There are several articles left and one monography that after his death was published after his death. And we will be speaking about this separately. Josef Arzimba with Ivani Ajinjale, first time took interest in the attire and the clothes of all Abkhazians. So by the learning of the history, so it was related only to the mountainous Abkhazians. So in description, their ethnography and the work was not stipulated, neither the archaeological data and, uh, for example, uh, so rich material uh, uh, depicted in the drawing. But it was the first attempt to gather this uh, material. So the archaeology was weakly developed in Abkhazia. Oh, those who conducted the research in Abkhazia of archaeological research is Georgi Chubinichvili with 
uh, who in 1922, by the initiation of Dmitry Gulia, by the newly established scientific uh, society, to, together with New LC League back, and he carried out archaeological uh, excavation in Sukhumi and around it. And for a long time, the excavation were not conducted. And, uh, and Josef Arzin by Valian Jijal could not have this data. But the scientific practical activities of Josef Arzin was related to the material uh, monuments or uh, learning of the mundane as well as the cult uh, buildings. So in 1924, then the Department of the Art was uh, established. So Arzinba was appointed the head of the protection of the cultural monuments. Until the end of his life, he was the head of this department division. So his scientific practical activities was uh, directed at the studying and protection of the cultural monuments, one of the most popular. So uh, near, uh, near the uh, Tamaria bridge, so while cleaning uh, this bridge in 1935, Arzinba so, uh, noticed the inscription on the west side of the bridge, and respective of the fact that the local population called Tamar's bridge in the 19th centuries. So Praskovia Ovarova, who loved the uh, antiquities, called it Venetian bridge. So the bridge and the inscription uh, by the invitation of Georgi Arzinba, Georgi Chubinishvili and Levan Chubinishvili studied that, who uh, concluded that this is the mid-age Georgian uh, construction, who the architect of which quite well knew the uh, characteristics of the river Beslehi, so which means so good selection of the construction of the bridge and in finding the best construction for the the best construction form for the bridge. So to evade flooding, uh, even the modern uh, so requirements are satisfied by uh, this bridge. So it can stand this uh, strong, so heavy weight. And it, this bridge should have been uh, standing on the road of the train. And uh, so with its uh, whereabouts, it is related to the debris of the old church. So which we can find 300 meters away. So it is probable that this bridge was relating this settlement with the sea. Those who protested, so the titling of the bridge by Praskovi Uvaro as Venetian bridge, so was Josef Arzindba. So he uh, later, so to decipher this uh, uh, inscription, he brought Emoras Barnavelli, and it turned out that it was built uh, uh, not in Tamar's epoch, but in the inscription. Uh, so uh, King Bagrat is uh, mentioned, and it was uh, built during Bagrat IV and his uh, uh, his grandson Bagrat IV, Guru Gashma and Stanislav Lakoba. So with the heart, we, unfortunately, we should mention, so in Abkhazian history, so they put uh, under question mark the Besleti Bridge and Tamar Bridge and the authenticity of the Georgian inscription, as if the uh, Besleti inscription, so as the eyewitnesses said, so it was made in the 30th, uh, 30th of the 20th century, I mean, there should be, they deserve no comments, but Lashuba and Akoba so put on the question marks, Josef Arzinba's scientific and uh, uh, human conscientious, conscientiousness. And Rajba went against his own father who had the high authority, scientific authority. So Rajba was the language, famous uh, uh, language expert. And it is regretful due to the political reasons so by non-scientific methods, so the science tries to evade important historical evidence and to respond to elementary bridge where from the Georgian inscriptions so appeared in Abkhazia if Georgians did not live there. And they totally exclude so the life of Georgians on Abkhazian territory. So in this textbook, so we don't see any uh, Georgians, so there is the uh, there is the connection seen with Armenians, Russians, with Goths, with Copts, but there is no connection seen with Georgian. 
so and the smile may be drawn uh, brought to your face so by this method that the majority of the georgian uh so inscription so it's found by the abkhazian area study experts so simple people and in bringing in finding this inscription bringing this inscription to Sukhumi. so and it is preserved in abkhazian state museum so and it is and merits be, belongs to Joseph Sarzin by Inzebelda. So uh, Debris, he found the ornamental uh, plate with the Georgian uh, inscription. So it is, uh, and he placed that in the exhibition area of Abkhazian State Museum. And when I was a student, it was placed there in 1967, this uh, inscription with its photo and with the uh, reading of Tamar Khojulia, Khubutib Gajba, uh, so published that. And the inscription says about the local uh, Luka Martinava, the story of building of the cross on the place of the building of the St. George's Temple. So Bedia is also uh, Josef Arzinba's merit. We don't know where is this inscription, so we cannot see in the inscriptions which Russian so uh, art expert Elena Indorcova published a uh, merit of uh, saving this Amuhi uh, for lapidary inscription. So the merit of Arzinba is great. And they published only photos of that. One of the inscription is Georgi Basilidze. So inscription is cut on the pillar. So the other side has also inscriptions. So Rosa Varzin was second time found this, discovered this inscription, and he put it in the exhibition area of the Sukhumi State Museum. And the inscription on the pillar so was also during my student uh, so years in the in the uh, exhibition hall. Anuhi Georgi Vasilidis inscription so speaks about the uh, history of building the wall. So from these inscriptions in the State Museum, in the exhibition of Kazia State Museum, nothing is exhibited, but they are uh, kept in the museum vault. So we know that from the Endorceva Russian art expert from uh, uh, so from her publication of 2019 and 2020. It is important in Abkhazia State Museum. So the preserved architectural decoration details without inscription, which in 1938 was placed by Josef Arzinba in the museum. So these architectural details are kept in the storage room of the museum. But they are not in exhibition. So there are some uh, in exhibition, but none of them are found by Joseph Arzimba. During his short uh, so life and activities, Joseph Arzimba managed to learn the many samples of Abkhazian uh, architectural monuments. Their description and architectural importance so was left as the handwriting, and only after ten years in his uh, after his death in 1958. So was published by his friend, by support of his friend Ajinjali. So the uh, from the clerical architecture. So uh, from uh, Zipi, Mokvi, Gdranda, Hasataba, Bombori, Pskari. So Gurchi uh, churches have been studied, and from the mundane. Uh, so uh, are Sukhumi and Bagrati fortresses, Choburkhinj. Rechokhiria, Jubja, Merkula, and Jihur uh, fortresses are described. The author is indicative in the in the indicating Jihuri uh, so fortress, which is uh, so near the estuary of the river of Juhu. So from these monuments, part of them are uh, are damaged. So and his work has a certain importance while studying these uh, uh, monuments. So part of the monuments does not exist at all for near this uh, village of Dikhadzurga on the low land, so where the old debris, so with that was distinguished back then. And this is not, this building is not existing this, and we have this information about this fortified place from Josef Aradzinba, uh work also regarding the large abkhazian uh, wall so we have the same uh, information so the part of the inscriptions 
so done by description so by, done by Erzin, but they are not existing so the method of the description of the monument when the actor tries to provide the distance from the nearest settlement near the river so he clarifies the uh, place of the monument on with respect to the relief he speaks about the measures of the uh, monument so architectural forms so, the uh, small stone reliefs and so on about the curvings that he did not have this education but he uh, also described the curves so ornaments and this is very interesting one detail it is true that Rossi Joseph Arzin by New Georgian but he did not uh, give the liberty to himself to decipher the inscription and he gave this job to the professionals. He understood how important these uh, uh, monuments were and he tried all the uh, uh, monuments, uh, what he brought to the Sukhumi uh, State Museum, all he, want, he put in the exhibition uh, area to make this accessible, all the artifacts, all the exhibits made to be uh, accessible for the viewers. So irrespective of the fact that so some play some stones without the inscription, he also put in the exhibition area. So this uh, the records of this are kept in the Abkhazian State Museum. It's also interesting, Josef Arzinba as the genuine Abkhazian paid attention to the description of the large wall of Abkhazia. This uh, monument stood as an uh, unresolved phenomenon until the end of his days. So he made the 10 uh, days exhibition. He recorded all the buildings which might be the part of the Abkhazian big wall. And first time he said about, about the importance of the wall and he made the decision that along this wall was uh, running. So the uh, very important trade road while the uh, description of the wall. So he considered uh, wrongfully so independent other buildings, for example, fortresses and the uh, watching towers. So, but these inscriptions did not, descriptions did not lose its importance because some of, of these fortresses are not existent today. It's very interesting one detail. We made the comparison so of uh, Josef Arzinba work, which was published in 1958 after 10 years of his death and during and the publications in newspapers during his life and he never mentions the abkhazian uh, large wall so grand wall and he is calling it kelasuri wall as it is accepted in georgian sources in the 50s after his death so this is after the death of stalin 1958 as it he, as it seems ajinjali so i suspect that the ajinjali took care to introduce these sort of changes in the work of Josef Arzimba. So in 1939, Josef Arzimba first time created so the map of the old monuments of Abkhazia with the fortification buildings, so the fortresses, so the uh, uh, so this map was also uh, made later on, but this map did not lose its importance. Uh, so in uh, there was even no corner left in Abkhazia for Yusuf Arzinba not to go on his old foot and not to see, not to visit this place in respect, irrespective of the fact that Yusuf Arzinba was not historian and the art expert. So some of his conclusions are uh, so lacking the grounds of the uh, scientific grounds. So he is under the Soviet ideology pressure. Uh, especially with respect to the monuments that got damaged later on or does not exist. And uh, finally, it is regretful that the, the Abkhazian champion of the Georgian uh, heritage, so nobody f was found in Abkhazia to continue his, uh, uh, his cause. So who could uh, so save the architectural monuments? So that is very important to preserve the authentic uh, authenticity of the cultural uh, 
uh, are uh, cultural monuments. So the publications, I omitted one slide. So he had the newspaper publications on the ground of that. I made the comparison with his monography, which was published 10 years after his death and in toponymics. So I would like to strongly emphasize that the toponymics are given in a different manner. So rather than it is given in set out in his monography after his death. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, distinguished Leah. So this is uh, very useful information for for us, for from for from regarding the pe person who was a champion. So unknown uh, names, we can call them unknown figures. Thank you very much for providing wide information on his activities, and I think in the part of the discussions. There will be many questions and considerations regarding that and our participants will get involved so that's why i give the floor to uh, madam tea kartulishvili kornelike kelidze so the head of the source of the source research and diplomatic so uh so the title is so the manuscript legacy of Abkhazia, Corneli Kekelidze. So manuscripts in the manuscript national center preserved historical documents according to the historical. Thank you very much for such an interesting and significant conference. Firstly, so as regards my report, as I have mentioned. So it refers to the National Center of Manuscripts, preserve the uh, manuscript uh, legacy, but we will speak about the historical document. So I would like to note that the Abkhazian artifacts, which are we are having today, so which are remaining today due to the political situation, current political situation. So we have the movable, uh, monuments that survived so they are uh, so in their first uh, uh, form uh, so they are kept in many museums of georgia and the majority of this is the hand uh, so manuscript legacy so the largest collection is preserved in corneli kekelidze so georgian manuscript uh, center and today i would like to uh, attract your attention to this so the materials kept in our uh, center, we can be divided in several parts. First is the handwritten books, second are the historical documents, and the third is so the written or the photo uh, materials. So in the private uh, collections, and the third is the map cartography sample. So we will be about what we will be speaking so are important the documents created in abkhazia as well as the documents containing information about abkhazia this historical information we have the first copies as well as we the copies so sometimes the originals and the copies sometimes the original is lost and the importance of the original is granted to the copy and we have the legal documents as well as non-legal document so documents of non-legal co contents. So in Abkhazian uh, hand, uh, so manuscript legacy is uh, occupying by uh, Abkhazia Catholicos uh, so, uh, documents, which is uh, embracing the 60th and 70th century after the 70th century there are no uh, conversation about abkhazia these documents and these scrolls are related mostly to the western part because abkhazia catholic catholicos uh, so residents embrace the whole western georgia and together with the kingdoms so and uh, so they there is a conversation about abkhazia as the part of the catholicos residents of abkhazia so as you might be aware, this Abkhazian Catholicos residence and Abkhazian Catholicos, so was the uh, so the highest clerical rank in the Western Georgia. And this term was published in the early, uh, so middle uh, ages. Then Abkhazian kingdom implied whole Western Georgia. 
and Abkhazian Catholicos residents. So uh, from the clerical standpoint, uh, from the church standpoint, so embrace all Western form. And this term is also transferred to the late Middle Ages, but we should mention in the uh, middle, uh, low, uh, middle, in the late Middle Ages, when uh, oh, Abkhazia entered as uh, the term of mentioning one of the corners of Georgia. For example, Tharion Catholicos, who was uh, active in 12th century, he calls so the Catholicos of Licht, Amir, Odishar, Guria, Lechum, so the ruler, so the uh, Catholicos patriarch, uh distinguished Besario. this is how he mentions himself regarding catholicos residents of abkhazia so from the documents we should uh, mention uh so by sajuloi we don't have the original so it is kept in the georgian archive so we have the copy of it and this document relates to the eastern western georgia abkhazian catholicos residents so independent uh, so the registering of it as the independent religious organization from Tsheta Catholicos uh, residents. So the term Abkhazia is used by two meanings. First, so ethnical geographical Abkhazia and as well as by the meaning of the Western Georgia. That was uh, indicating Abkhazian and uh, Catholicos uh, so territory. Proceeding from the context, of course, between the scientists, there are different standpoints, but both by both terms are used by its meaning. In Tsnebai Sajuloi, this document, also another important document is Bichwinta Yadgari. So Bichwinta Yadgari is for Catholicos residents. So uh, by uh, the so the compilation of the documents. Uh, so donated to by different individuals to these Catholicos residents. Well, what is this between the Yadgari when it was created? So Abkhazian Catholicos came from Bichwinta and in Gelati, he has his residence in Gelati, so St. George, so church. But due to the fond fact that Yadgari is containing the documents from different period, one is so-called Sasislo Sigeli, which was granted by the Emirati king to the Bichuita temple so in the 16th uh, century. And here we see that Abkhazian Catholicos, he is still sitting in Bichuita and this uh, donation, so this privilege, so was granted back then. And for us, it is interesting that So in the between the temple is implied the patriarchs, apparatus, so or employees and uh, his serfs. So the fact that so this is the this was created in the first part of Bagarati's uh, kingdom. So being a king, so in the, uh, then the residence was moved to Gelati. So these uh, privileges are granted to the. Uh, uh, to the temple and the second part of his being a king, he did not provide it such privileges and it had the concrete meaning of that. In between the Yadgari are given the lands which belongs to Abkhazia Catholicos uh, residents. So on the scale of the Western Georgia, and we concretely speak about the lands so, which he belongs, which he owns in Abkhazia. And here I have presented the uh, lands uh, list the identification of this uh, lens so, was done by Cornelia Rahamia, who, who published the documents about Bichvinta Yadgari. So, so Catholicos cross. Cross books are very sin significant from the point of view of their information from the Catholicos Malachi. And uh, uh, we at the center have one of the very important documents which deals with the donation of Kalitska and Kalitska to this church. So it has no date, accurate date, text is damaged, but the rest which is safe gives such an 
kind of information that these donations took place even earlier. So when this took place, clearly we have another document which belongs to Levan II Dadiani. And Levan II says or writes that along with his spouse, Nestan Darajan, he donated to the Chwinka Church and the icon of the Most Holy Mother of the God, he donated Galizga and Galizga states. So in 17th century, particularly 1670s, these documents had been modified. Formerly, it was said that uh, they clergymen, they got and the serfs were donated. Later, later, this top grade clergyman and church of said, yes, tried to be at its best to retain the serfs. We have documents uh, issued by uh, Catholicos Grigo and also David Lemstase, his predecessor, and these documents say that David Lemstase got yes, they, uh, that uh, he got from uh, the priest the whole family of Sars. And you see, this document, this document says that since then times, the princes Samagrela, they started to deprive serfs and even the whole families from the territory and from the estates and uh, the authority of the Catholicos and turned, converted them into their own subordinates. Thus, for instance, 60 households formerly uh, just uh, lived in one of the villages and later, approximately a generation later, just only six households had been left there. And sometimes clergymen even addressed it and demanded, even required the formal documents as sort of oath from Sharvashid, the princes that they would not just uh, sell uh, their serfs to a sort of surety, guarantee that they would not sell these um, serfs to other princes, like, for instance, the princess Dadiani. Uh, so it's, it's very, very important uh, uh, document. So the second, second uh, document uh, which uh, was issued by Papu Sharvashid and his son Afsandil. Also, they demanded it from the Catholicos, the document, a sort of uh, um, Davy that this person won't sell uh, people to uh, search to other princes because the country had been desolated, they said. And uh, those ones who still are there in on their territories even are donated to the princes as a sort of maybe it looks like a bribe in order to you know, just admonish and uh, uh, these uh, uh, princes not to sell other persons, other serfs. They were besieging them, actually, we may say. So, people or serfs who were, who were sold en masse from Abkhazia, their amount was enormously big. And, uh, you see, if they could emancipate themselves, they 
where or they adopted some privileged status. For instance, the group of Serbs were sold to Ottomans. And then, then they just escaped or something like this and uh, they addressed uh, the Catholicos and Catholicos really cherished them, privileged, they were privileged and uh, you know, the territory for living, the um, habitat uh, was given to them in Odishi. So, in here, the document, uh, and later, it's, it's the last document which uh, says, uh, uh, which gives information about the removal of serfs from Abkhazia to Obishi or Tamagrelo, the principalities, um, alias Tamagrelo, principality. And uh, actually, it looks like that this territory beyond Nguri. Uh, the right bank of Anguri was out of control of uh, uh, Odishi uh, princess, the Diani uh, princess. And uh, in 1680, uh, territory in, uh, in, in early 19th century. That even stated themselves, promulgated themselves as the serfs of Dadiani. And when Dadiani just uh, swore an oath of loyalty to the Russian emperor, uh, also he serves the princess of Abkhazia, the uh, Sharvashidza. They, the Sharvashidzas, they stated, promulgated themselves as the subordinates and uh, loyal to Russian imperial power because they were serfs of, uh, legally, formally, they were serfs <coughs> of uh, Prince uh, uh, Dadiani. Uh, so, one document, uh, one document says that through the Lord's blessing, uh, that Dadiani Laon, uh, he was actually exercised paramount authority over Swanetti, Sanagrello, Abkhazia, and uh, uh, this document was sent to Georgi, the top grade clergyman, Archimand Rich. And uh, he says that through his contribution, he uh, promulgated his loyalty to imperial forces, and through his private, personal, and divorce, this vast territory was gathered and uh, subjected to his personal uh, power. We really uh, think that Sharashita, Yogi Sharashita's uh, you know, letter, it's very interesting, in which dates from 1820, and Yogi Sharashita sends this letter to General Velyaminov. Uh, he stresses that Abkhazia uh, is uh, part of something like subordinate territory under the ownership of uh, the Tadiani uh, princess uh, and the paper. So, but if we take to Ottoman letterings, see, it's really good characteristic of then times situation in Abkhazia. Georgi Shagwashita, he, yes, he was poor in Georgia. He preferred Abkhazia. And from time to time, he also inserted uh, Ottoman letterings, or maybe it was Persian or Arabic, which was used by, were used by Ottomans during that time. So, and he, so he, maybe he just uh, uh, was poor in his uh, Georgian, but uh, 
former Pantoil was handled by him in Georgia and generally in Abkhazian, uh, Abkhaz nobleman belong to Sharash in the family. So they're Stafawani and Georgian, uh, Georgianism, Georgian vision and approach, Georgian perception was pretty strong and uh, valid in the self awareness of Abkhaz uh, noblemen from the Sharvashi's uh, family. And uh, Georgi La writes even there that uh, here uh, he also uh, just uh, accompanies this letter by his own seal. And uh, uh, other documents which are less impaired, less damaged, and they are full by. And uh, that uh, still is preserved at Zugdivi, Dadiani, the Dadiani Museum. And uh, uh, thus we just put Shad uh, on this uh, seal and the um, self awareness of Abkhaz uh, uh, priests uh, who vowed there that uh, my Georgian is poor. But he tries to do it through his own paperback writer. And still, of course, he's uh, legalized uh, by this uh, seal, which has Georgian lettering. It must be taken into account. So the language for communication actually was Georgian. It was like uh, uh, the court language, language of the court of the times. Uh, for instance, uh, in Georgian, the letter is uh, uh, written, uh, delivered, and addressed to Juan Gelovani, Georgi Gelovani, and again uh, ordered, uh, written by the order of uh, Abkhaz uh, prince. Structurally, structurally, all standards are preserved and observed, which during the times uh, were. Uh, pursued in Georgian uh, pampoil, official formal pampoil on the top uh, level between nobleman and uh, we may say that during the times Abkhaz princes they uh, just issued their documents and handled pampoil in Georgian. It was official uh, language, and we may say that they were part and parcel of the Georgian spiritual environment. Thank you very much for your attention.